Welcome to The State of Us. Beyond mainstream cable news and party lines, with a millennial and a boomer, The State of Us pushes past the noise and uncovers all the issues that matter. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. Politicians, economists, and many everyday Americans discuss the possibility and reality of automation displacing workers. On today's episode, we're referencing the high cost of impeding automation, an article in the Wall Street Journal. And it's got a lot of different interesting information for us. One of the first things it leads off with explains why you should care about impeding automation. A recent Pew Research survey shows that 85% of Americans are in favor of policies to restrict the rise of robots beyond hazardous work. And perhaps more important, there's compelling evidence that factory automation swung three key Rust Belt states, including Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, in favor of Donald Trump in the 2016 election. So you've got 85% of Americans who are in favor of policies that restrict this type of stuff. And then you've also got the last presidential election may have been won in part based off of fears of automation. So there's a lot of different reasons you could care, but I think it boils down to it's ultimately something that has the potential to affect all of us. Whether or not our job is likely to be uh, replaced by some form of automation in our lifetime, uh, whether or not that's the case, an area of our life is likely to be impacted by it. In other words, there may come a day where Lance walks into a fast food joint and there's no people there to serve him. So there's a lot of different reasons you could care. But of course, we couldn't begin this critical conversation without. True Chat senior historian and an educator of more than 30 years. Here is your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Jackson. Well, they've had those around since the 50s and 60s in New York City, where you could walk in and buy an entire meal. Mm -hmm. through a a vending machine, a hot meal, right? you know, so with no people, you just put the money in and the bowl dropped and the soup went in or or whatever the, you know, whatever they did. I mean, they've they've had that in the past and that's what people don't understand. But this has been an issue throughout history as we'll talk. Uh, People are always afraid of change, Um, but usually change wins out as we'll see as we get into the show. So you can, 85% of Americans can be against this, but at some point it's going to happen. Percentage of Americans who say the automation of jobs through new technology in the workplace has mostly done the following. So the percentage of Americans who say uh, that automation has hurt jobs is 55% for those ages 50 and older, while ages 18 to 49, 43%. Uh, the percentage that say it has helped, this may be more telling even, mm-hmm. okay? T- only 20% of ages 50 and up say that automation has helped. Right. While t- only 24% of ages 18 to 49. So here's where the distinction comes in, the category neither, right? For that 18 to 49 crowd, it's 31% say it's neither helped nor hurt, while only 25% of ages 50 and older. So by far the consensus among age 50 and older is that it hurts. They're used to things being done one way, and they don't realize that can be done another way. And again, as I said, we're, you can look back in, in time, and people always are going to stand up against – I mean, I do it occasionally, but most of the time, I, hopefully people understand that I do it in jest. I know it's coming. I know it's going to happen because you can't stop it because it's going to make life better. We don't like it now. Yes, you can't do job A anymore, but it's going to create jobs B, C, and D. And so, you know, new jobs are going to be created. New ways of doing things are going to be done. And you're going to go with the flow or you're going to get left behind. Well, and that's kind of the thing that we're going to talk about right in the second half is how historically speaking, no matter how hard people try – it pretty much pushes forward no matter what, right? Progress happens. What people don't understand is, yes, they understand it's going to change their life, but they think it's going to under, it's, it's going to change their lives in a negative fashion. That's not true. The world's going to pass you by, and you better jump on. And the sooner you jump on, the easier it is to catch the train. 
You don't right. want the train to get up to full speed and, and then, then try it's going to run and then try to run and jump, jump on, you know, and it's, I'm sorry, train. Do we have trains anymore? But yeah, I mean, it, that's the kind of the mindset. 52% of Americans think probably, they say they think that robots and computers, um, will do much of the work done by humans in the next 30 years. Sure. Percentage of Americans who think that robots will do the type of work I do within the next 30 years, 38% say probably not. But we, we, we do, I mean, I don't like it. You know, the McDonald's, all the fat, not all, but many of the fast food places now have ordering boards where you just go in and order and you don't, the only interaction you have with a human is to get your food from behind the counter. And I despise those things. I will not go. I will stand at the counter until somebody comes to wait on me. But it's coming. I mean, I can do that. Okay. And even someday you may be waiting forever, but someday I'm going to wait forever. <laughs> exactly. Because there won't be. I mean, that's my point. I understand it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I know it's coming and I can stand in the way of it. But one of these days, nobody will come to the counter to take my cash. I'm going to have to get a card so that I can do transactions. Automation and inequality. Now, this one, I think, is of all the concerns, this this is probably the most legitimate. And it's not to say these other ones aren't legitimate, okay? For example, in this last one, right, 52% of people say that much of the work that's done by humans will probably be done by robots within the next 30 years, 52%. A little over half of people believe that. You know, you say robot, and I think we all have this image that comes up in our head, but we, we mean automation. We mean some sort of automated process where a computer is probably handling a significant portion of it or some kind of programmed machine. But even in education, both my daughters are getting um, advanced degrees. One's working on their master's, the other's working on their on a doctorate. And they're taking it online. Okay, but it didn't it didn't mean that teaching or the education profession chain, I mean, is gone. They have professors, but the professors upload videos, they get on chat boards, they get on line together and have video chats. So it's it's not so the nature of the job changed, but there still needed to be a professor, but it's all done. They, they never enter a classroom, you know, and, and they graduate with an advanced degree. So the last one is one where I think this is the, this is the trick to getting automation right. So this is the percentage of Americans who say that if robots and computers do most of the work currently being done by humans, the following are likely or unlikely to occur. Inequality between rich and poor would increase. 76% believe that that's likely if robots displace most jobs, uh, while only 23% find it unlikely. And then the other one, the economy would create many new, better-paying jobs for humans. 66% believe that that's unlikely if Robots replace most jobs, while 33% believe it's likely. So more to talk about, particularly from a history component. What does history tell us about automation in the past? How has society dealt with it? And what has the outcome been? Uh, plenty more to talk about. So keep it right here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. We are The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. A recent Pew Research survey shows that 85% of Americans are in favor of policies to restrict the rise of robots. So, uh, and that's beyond hazardous work. So we've talked about kind of so far laying the groundwork of how people feel and what they think about all this. Hopefully now we're going to get into uh, making sure people have the right type of information, particularly from a historical context. And even if you're not somebody who loves history, knowing that automation is not a new thing. Now, the type of automation that we're looking at is new, but automation itself is not new. Uh, in fact, we can date right all the way back to um, 1412. But mm -hmm. for today's sake, uh, go ahead, Lance. You're going to you're going to. But the Gutenberg printing press in 1470 drew many protests uh, from writers in Italy, from card makers in Germany and French stationers. Uh, 
all in the 1470s because it's like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? You mean we're not going to write everything anymore by hand? I mean, I'm not going to have a job. You're just going to run multiple copies through a printing press? Because what people, what people used to have to do, right? If, if I wrote a book, Justin wrote a book and Lance wanted a copy, we'd have to pay Bradley to by hand read each word and copy it over into a new book. Now we have printing presses. It's computerized. It's, it's I mean, look at the changes that we have. You mean you really want to go back to when everybody had to write it by hand? I mean, people would go crazy. You know, I mean, only wealthy people had books. Only wealthy people had, you know, the access, the opera, to, knowledge. access to, to those kinds of things. Right. You didn't even have access to it because you couldn't afford to pay somebody to write you a book. So, you know, I mean, they're all, oh no, a copy machine. Right. I mean, but there I, were lots of people who had I mean, a I job remember, of right. copying stuff. Exactly. Right? I mean, that right. was their whole livelihood. That was a job. You went in, you know, that you went in every day and you wrote, you know, you wrote yep. from the master copy. So people were so, nervous then. Right. About this All the way back in 1470. Okay. Mm-hmm. We're going to jump at three or 400 years and we're going to come to 1811 and the Luddite movement named after a supposed Leicester Stockinger apprentice named Ned Ludham, who responded to his master's reprimand by taking a hammer to a stocking frame and began the destruction of machines in Great Britain in 1811. So, hey, machines are going to take our jobs, so we'll just destroy all of the machines. It's going to happen, people, because in in the long run, it makes life better. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, you lose the job. That you've been doing, but there will be another job. The three of us in this room probably wouldn't be very happy if we uh, were transported back to the 1700s. Because, there, I mean, our, our way of life would be so vastly different. You know, and we think, well, that's not that long ago. But one of the big uh, statistics, I'm reading John Adams' biography right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of the big things they mention in there is the amount of time you know, that common tasks took people. That it takes. Uh, right. Everything, everything that, you know, we totally take for granted now, but one of the reasons, uh, that somebody, and obviously it, it was women, uh, 99% of the time, but somebody needed to stay home is because it was a full time job just to keep things clean and put food on the table. Right. Uh, because it took so long. I mean, think about, you know, no vacuum, no washing machines. Right, you can't buy a Swiffer at the store to dust your windows. Well, you sales. didn't go to the store you to know? buy your food. You canned it, right, to put it away. So I mean, you had to you tend know. to the garden. You know, I mean, it, all these. That's things. why you call it a can of green beans, is because people used to actually can them. There was a process at home mm-hmm. with which you took your green beans from the garden, your excess green beans, and developed a system to where you could put yeah. them on the shelf. Well, aside from if we went back to the 1700s, the profession that the three of us are in right now here in this studio wouldn't even exist. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. So let's be right? a Luddite. Let's be Luddites and say, no, we don't want technology, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think people too often don't think about- Being sarcastic to people. The things that it's enabled, you know? No automobile, right? I mean- Well, I mean, you're even, talking about all of mass uh, distribution. Yeah. You know? Mass transit, yeah, making things. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like, um, really, do you want to get uh, get rid of mass production? None of us could afford a car. None of us would have any of the things that we have because they're cheaper. Because machines can make them quicker, more efficiently. I'm gonna say better, but they make them decently enough that we can all use them. But let's talk about a government, our own government, in 1933, i.e., the Great Depression, the administration of President. Franklin Delano Roosevelt tried to slow the pace of mechanization machines of the 280 regulations issued by the National Recovery Administration. 36 included restrictions on the installation of new machines. And ultimately he was trying to put people back to work. Right. But we needed machines to win World War II. So when the United States was dragged kicking and screaming into World War II, and I mean that almost literally, the populace did not want to join the war. The war broke out and FDR had to hold everybody's hands and lead us to get involved in the war. And then it was the attack on Pearl Harbor. But at that point, FDR had been mobilizing the machines because he knew the only chance we had to defeat Germany and Japan wasn't to make things by hand, but we're going to have to make them by machines. And so, you know, he tries to stop machines and then has to use the machines. Now, 
come to 2018 and members of the Culinary Union in Las Vegas voted to authorize a strike if contract negotiations with casino operators failed to address concerns including job security and retraining regarding automation. We support innovations that improve jobs, but we oppose automation when it only destroys jobs, said the union secretary treasurer. So 1470 with the Gutenberg printing press all the way to 2018. Well, and the data tells us that, for example, even in a recent MIT study, economists found that multipurpose robots have replaced about 3.3 jobs in the U.S. economy and reduced real wages. Now, so that sounds like, oh my gosh, this is really bad, right? I mean, automation is bad. However, on the flip side of that, over the years, automation has greatly increased the wealth and well-being of the world as a whole. Exactly. And, and that's and this brings us to the problem, right? In the short term, automation is bad for workers. In the short term, it almost always is because it does replace. I don't like the word destroys because it's just taking the place of a human worker, you know. How about the, the word the, displace? The job it, it displaces right. the job doesn't workers. go away. You know, somebody a, a robot still has to do the job. It's just not Lance and it will doing do it the job. better and more efficiently, right. which will make for a better and safer product than well, that you and I purchase. And the canning robot, use. right? It doesn't get tired, it doesn't right. get worn out. It cans you know, probably millions of cans an hour. And Lance can do how many, how much can you can in an hour? Oh, I mean, all the prep and process. And, you know, maybe depending on how big of a fire you have and how big a container you have, maybe 10, 12 cans. Right. In an hour. Yeah. So (laughs) not comparable, right? And it's a big job. I mean, it's not just the hour of the actual canning. It's everything else that you're going to put into it. So the, the point in coming back to that is, it's the short term versus the long term thing, which we talk about a lot on this show, uh, and how that varies. So we're well, gonna- and it creates new jobs. Somebody's got to take care of the machines, right? I mean, they do need to be repaired. They do need to be taken care of and conditioned and to continue to work. So a new job is created. Well, this is not the job that you've been used to doing. Take perhaps the engine of automation in this age, right? The computer. The computer comes about and it built an entire new industry. Uh, jobs. I mean. Podcasting. We'll just take that for an example because that's what Lance and I do, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, That did not exist 30 years ago. Right. It it just didn't. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't even an option because there, and now there are more than 500,000 podcasts around the world and it's an advertising industry worth uh, more than a hundred million dollars every year, you know? So, and that's small in comparison to other industries, but that's just one tiny sub industry it's just, it's just as growing. a result right. of the internet, you know? And you could even say there would be without the internet, there would be no smartphones, you know, because what would be the point in a right. smartphone if you didn't have internet? Well, and you take, and, you take my career. Yeah. When I started teaching, there was no such thing as a computer. Right. Well, I had to learn to use a computer if I wanted to continue to teach the last 20 years of my career. So attendance, grading, all of it, right? I mean, all of that move. Putting up information. I mean, the kids respond better to it. They they watch YouTube. I need to find out what YouTube is there because there were videos on there. There were teaching tools that I could use mm-hmm. that made my classroom better. And maybe saved you some time. Right. I mean, and that's the that's the goal of all of it in the end, right? Is to make life better. I mean, when I started, I had to order films from the Montgomery County Library in Dayton a week ahead of time. So that I could show it on a reel to reel screen. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And now, I mean, think about that. Now I can be in my classroom and in two minutes type something into YouTube or into the search engine and a video pops up and right. you got I, your clip. I, I throw it on the screen, yeah. you know, for the students to and watch. And you didn't have to hassle with finding out who has it, right? Where it is. Get them to send it to you. Wait for it to come. I don't have to thread the machine. Thread the machine. I, I don't have to make sure the ball, have an extra ball and when then the you ball have to blows send it back. out. Right. I mean, <laughs> none of that. So, uh, th- what we're looking at next and in the last bit is how do we navigate this? Cause we've identified there is a, there is a legitimate concern, which is that jobs do get displaced. The, the flip side of that is, like too many things in today's world, we look at it as an either or, right? It's either you're for automation or you're against it. 
Um, and the problem with a lot of the policies I think that we're going to look at is they're too short sighted in all they seek to do is stop automation. Right. And that is not the answer. Uh, but there are some answers. And part of the reason we're doing this, Lance, right, is because, uh, because of True Chat's mission. And that's the network that produces, uh, the State of Us podcast. That is correct. And our mission here at True Chat is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. So hopefully we're, we're uh, doing that. And if you want to follow along with today's article, the state of us.org, we've got more to talk about. Where do we go from here? Uh, how do we navigate the world of automation to make sure that that 76% who believe it's likely that inequality between rich and poor would increase with automation? How, what do we do about that? Plenty more to come. Keep it right here on the state of us. And we'll be right back. The State of Us. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. 76% of Americans believe that inequality between rich and poor would increase if robots and computers do most of the work currently done by humans. So obviously there's a, there's a large concern uh, that wealth inequality will increase with automation. And as we discovered in a recent study by MIT economists, they found that multipurpose robots have replaced about 3.3 jobs in the U.S. economy and reduced wages. So there is a legitimate fear to the displacement, right, of mm-hmm. jobs by robots. There, And the question is, what do we do to make sure that with automation? Because I think generally the way this – the way it plays out for me anyway, uh, Lance, is that if – right, if a job that I had is displaced by a robot, mm-hmm. the person benefiting – is ultimately the owner of whatever that company is, right? And the shareholders. Right. Or the well, stockholders. That, I guess that's what I mean by owners. Okay. Um, the shareholders or if it's a, you know. Well, I mean, the CEO is going to benefit because yeah. his paycheck's going to get bigger and, you know, costs are going to go the down. The top level, right. right, of the company. But also the people who own the stock in the company yes. are also going to benefit mm-hmm. because the profit margin's higher. Right. So the point in all and of that is. And the wheel is, goes round and round and it's called capitalism. Yes. The, the concern becomes that if many companies do this, right, the people who are the few at the top, they will accumulate more wealth because they'll save money by replacing those jobs. And therefore, the difference between the everyday American and the wealthiest Americans will grow. But our, but to our friend Chris Hamilton, who we talked to, who is, you know, the strong socialist in our, in our close knit group here. Yeah. Um, somebody has to make the machines. Somebody has to build the robots. And but those we got are machines gonna, building machines. Those now. are going to be okay, but somebody's got to draw them. Somebody's got to come up with the idea. And I know you're going to get into AI and all that kind of stuff. And machine but there, learning. There are going to be jobs for people that will pay good money. There's just not going to be the job that pays people for grunt labor. Right. Well, and to me. So, so yes, I understand that, but it's not just, well, there's going to be jobs that will pay more. So the jobs that people have will pay more. So, and I'm going to say this, okay. And the wheels of capitalism go round and round. Now, if you don't want capitalism, and that's where I think some of the disconnect, and I'm not going to try to go take you too far afield. I'll let you go back here. But if you believe in capitalism, you can't have a job for everybody. The two don't work. Right. And you, you're not at a hundred percent employment ever in capitalism. Right. Because it's, because you always have people who aren't in the workforce. That's right. part, that's the nature for whatever of, reason. of the cycle. Yes. I guess what I get to here, because when we talk about, so go ahead. I just, I just, I just had to make that statement because so many, I think so many of these people who would be displaced workers say they believe in capitalism. And yeah. then it would be nice if in the same poll, and, and it's like, people, well, wait a minute, you can't have it both ways. Capitalism is good, right? You, you can't know? have it both ways. I mean, you know, if if the country were to decide to to go to communism, okay, then hey, there we go. Everybody's got a job and everybody gets paid the same and blah blah. That's not a, the system, though, that we believe in. And so if, if you do believe in capitalism, the, the the issues that you're bringing up are real and they do happen. 
So, so which is it? And most of these people would be, I mean, you talked about the Rust Belt states that voted for Donald Trump. They voted for Donald Trump because he said, I'm going to save your job. I'm going to save your 20th century job that needs to go away because we're now in the 21st century. So do you believe in capitalism or not? And if you do, then this changing of the guard needs to take place in order for capitalism to continue to grow. Because that's how that's how capitalism always works. That's how it, and it doesn't and, matter if it's this century or 500 centuries ago. That's how capitalism works. Well, in the book you and I actually just read not that long ago, right? Right. Uh, our book on capitalism. On which, American capitalism. On American capitalism, yes. In fact, highlights um, from the 50s to the 2000s, kind of the uh, the flow that we went through there of when we took a downturn and we stopped progressing and stopped innovating. Now, this wasn't – it wasn't so much that we were putting things in the way of innovation as companies just got lethargic because they were at the top and they stopped seeking to be better. Right. They, they created all these middle management positions who produced nothing. Right. And so – They were not needed. <laughs> right. And in the meantime – Overseas competition was racing to catch up. And once you plateau, right, and they're still on the upward climb, eventually they're going to pass you. Right. It's like, it's like going down the, going down the road and this person's doing 80 and you're doing 65. And then all of a sudden you see them in your rearview mirror and they're right up to you and you punch it. They're going to go right on by you because it's going to take you a, a while to get you can't from 65 to 80 and they're already there, yeah. which is exactly what you were explaining. Well, and that's the other side of this that we leave out too often. Even if uh, our government, right, the American government, quote unquote, protects us from the displacement of automation – there's only so much they they can do. Forget even if they make it illegal for companies in the U.S. to do it. That doesn't stop people in other countries from doing it. And that doesn't stop companies in the U.S. from leaving to go to other countries to seek it out. So the point is, it never and can. And American companies can't compete. Right. It never can last. Because even if we do things to artificially save jobs here, it doesn't work in the long run because other countries won't do that. Right. You know, and that some will. I mean, some do. But in the long run, somebody else will do it and they'll do it uh, cheaper and faster and better, you know, and then the companies here will either adapt and go that direction or they'll die. Right. Because that's the type, again, to Lance's point, that's the type of economy we have. Now, we talked about not that long ago, socialism and capitalism, right? Yes. Uh, and so you should go back and listen to that episode because that's kind of a, a different vein. But to me, one of the things that's missed on this a lot, Lance, when we talk about jobs that are created and what's what's the future, you know, 50 years from now, what does the workplace look like? Because there's going to be a lot less manual labor type jobs. Exactly. Right? I totally agree with that statement. The one thing is that we've seen that's drastically increased is the service industry again. And right. it would be interesting to kind of look at the ebb and flow of the service industry. Right. Uh, Cause there were times in our history where it was much higher, where mm -hmm. uh, there were lots of people who worked in service type jobs. And what I mean by that is people who uh, would go get you food or go pick up your clothes or go get groceries for you. That used to be more common. And then it kind of went away for a while in part because uh, you know, everybody could have a car now, right? So it's like it's, jobs where you were being served. Yes. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. people were doing something for you. And then as it kind of faded away, now it's coming back in part because of technology enabling it to be cheaper than what happened in the past where it got so expensive that it was no longer feasible. It's like, well, I'm not going to pay, you know, $50 for somebody to go get my groceries. I can go get my groceries. I have this nice car. That's part of me being an American, right? Is I own this. Right. I own this car and I can drive and I can go get my. But if you're in California and gas is $4 a gallon and somebody, you can sign up for a service. For $10. Who will deliver your groceries for you for $50 a month yeah. anytime you order groceries. Well, then heck, you're going to save money in gasoline alone. Well, in the time. I mean, in a lot of these big metros, you know, the store may not be very far away, but how long it's going to take you to get there. I mean, you could be in traffic for 30 minutes to an hour just trying to get to a store that's a. My daughter worked this summer for one of those mm -hmm. companies. And she did other people's shopping. Right. And they, you know, she got paid per order on the size of the order, but the people paid for the service and they could order groceries every day mm -hmm. and their bill didn't change. They paid X amount of money for the service and they could, I mean, she would deliver multiple times to the same household. Right. In the same month. So again, the, the process of automation opens doors 
to things that haven't been thought of as well. It's not just about we lost these jobs and they got replaced by robots. It's what does freeing up those workers and enabling faster production of certain items uh, entail? The innovation. Big, you said it right, earlier. Innovation. It's, it, innovation. Because – uh, microchips in computers, which was a huge thing. I mean, you look at pictures of the early computers, you know, the, the size of the studio we're in would hold a computer that could do less than one tenth of what the, uh, two pound tablets that Lance and I right. have in front of us can do now. You know, yep. probably one tenth is too much, probably one one hundredth or something, you know, and they take up this whole room. Um, and because we got better at automating the process of making those computers, we now have these little computers with all this power that can be put all over the place, right? Well, Which, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the lithium battery. Mm -hmm. So expensive. And now because there's a need for them, they're finding a way to make them better, longer and cheaper. Yep. Now they're going to be more uses that we're going to find for them. Well, and that has opened the door to the type of service that your daughter worked for over the summer, right? right? Because now she can use her phone, which is this super mm -hmm. computer in the palm of her hand that has a lithium ion battery in it yep. that lets that company more effectively execute a service that used to exist a long time ago that went away because it became too expensive, but now it's cheaper again because well, like the I've company always, doesn't have hardly like any I've cost. always told you, none of this is new. We've just found a faster, cheaper way to do it. I mean, you know, all of these things that we come up with, is they're not new. That we, you know, there used to be rule-free delivery mm -hmm. in the in the United States. Okay, well now we just have Amazon. Right, it's faster. <laughs> you know, but it's not new. Everybody, you know, each generation they don't study history. So if you're 40 years removed from it, oh, this is a new concept. And you and I have talked on multiple occasions. It's not new. We've just found a faster, more efficient way to do what we used to do. Bradley, did you know that the first computers were in fact people, not machines? And uh, that's one of those things we don't realize. The name that we use to refer to these devices, these were human individuals whose job was to compute typically mathematical functions of some kind. Um, but NASA, when they went to put a person on the moon, had rooms of computers, which were not machines, they were people, right. you know, sitting and doing were long doing the hand, math. Right, yeah. doing long hand math. Uh, in order to calculate all sorts of different, um, all sorts of different statistics and so forth in order to be able to accomplish tasks at hand. The problem was you had literally had to have rooms of people in order to do math problems that now I can use this device that I can carry with me and it can do it in literally less than a second. Well, you know? like Bradley working on his calculus, you know, right before we came into the studio, mm -hmm. he's got this little, he just calls right up and does that. Before it might take ten people sitting yeah. in a room to get that problem done. Now, now the the part that takes the most time is keying in what you need the computer to give you the answer to, not getting right. the answer. Right, right. And it used to be the other way. The short part was writing out the problem, and then the long part was trying to figure it out. Now it's just the reverse. The yep. computer will, you know, snap your fingers just and there's it the to answer you right now. Um, but so the the point in all this is that there are other jobs and new industries that get created as a result of this. The challenge in the short term, and this is where I think um, our leadership, our governments play a role, is in the retraining of the displaced exactly. workforce. That is the key. Uh, to me, that's the, that's where the focus needs to be. You don't need to stifle innovation. Now, I do believe in sensible policy about, uh, you know, you also – you get to where we are now, which is innovation is pushing the limits in terms of Facebook, Google, Microsoft, right? They're pushing the bounds. And now legislators are taking a look and saying, okay, yeah, we may have to think about some things in regards to the privacy that are outdated because we we haven't been prepared for right. this type we of stuff. We wrote these laws for th things that yes. didn't exist and now exist. So that's I mean, creating new laws. So the two things – um, the retraining and continued education of the workforce, making it easier for them to get new jobs. Agreed. I believe that that is something, uh, that we can do to, to, I guess I don't want to say, I, I to, would say to, to mitigate, to, to soften it's the not blow. A problem. Yeah. To, to soften the blow right. of change. To ease the transition. There you go. That will take place again, as we've established, regardless. We can either make it easier for people or not, but either way it will happen. Um, whether overseas companies kill our companies because we didn't innovate, uh, or because the company itself makes the decision to pull the plug on this type of work. And the eventuality the, is, is determined. Right. It will happen. 
And then the second thing that I think is super important in this age of how fast innovation is happening, especially with the advent of computers and as we get into artificial intelligence, machine learning, these types of things that will only serve to accelerate the process of automation, right, and of technological advancement. In that age, we must make serious adaptations to our government to allow it to function and react to these things in a more timely manner. Uh, one of the things that became so clear in a lot of the Facebook testimony on Capitol Hill was just how little our legislators had any idea what any of this stuff meant. And on top of that, still basically really haven't done anything to make headway on protecting Lance and I's and all of you out there on our rights to our information. Right. I mean, this was was wasn't that like over a year or a yeah, year and a half ago. I think so. Right. And in the meantime, Facebook and all the others, they're still climbing. Right. We're back to our car thing. Mm -hmm. They're still speeding ahead at 85 miles an hour. We're going 60 and we haven't even put our foot on the accelerator. Right. You know, we're not even trying to catch up at the moment. So I think that I'm not sure that's a probably an episode all its own, Lance, but diving into what can we do to make government more efficient in dealing with new technologies that comes about because you don't want to slow it down because of the legislative process. At the same time, you also don't want the legislative process to be 50 years behind because it just isn't keeping up anymore with the speed at which advancements occur. Well, we need to close this episode, but as we've addressed and you've addressed before, you have people my age and older who are trying to come to grips and make laws for industries that they really don't know how they operate, mm -hmm. which I think was a, a very th good point that you made six months ago or whatever when we yeah. were talking about this. There's a real need for um, either an adaptation to an existing department or a department's all its own inside of the United States government that deals with technological advancements and providing real and easy to understand access to specifically lawmakers, but to the American people as a whole, you know, provide it to lawmakers. But since you're doing that, provide it to we have the Congressional Budget Office. Right. And we right. have had because the whole thinking was instead of expecting a congressman to to be an expert in finance and be able to figure out the financial implications of things, we should have a nonpartisan group inside the government that does that work and then gives it to them so they can make smart decisions. Well, we have a first today, in, in, at least in a long time. That you and I both agree on what the solution is. Yeah. And that is government's got to get out ahead of this and that it's going to happen eventually. So you might as well start planning for it. Yes. And we got to do what we can to retrain people who uh, are going to be displaced by it um, because it's going to happen as long as we choose to live in the world's greatest economy. On that note, you can follow along the state of us.org. Lots of good stuff coming there. Uh, Lance and I's book list available soon where you can read what we're reading. And there's a lot of stuff coming up this month. Um, so actually, I believe next week, Lance, right? Uh, mm -hmm. On Tuesday, uh, Barrio America, which is a new book coming out. You guys can tune into that and um, we'll have the author on to discuss uh, immigration in the United States and how it's impacted our economy in the past. A lot of good a lot of good data in this book, and we're going to try to break it down for you. So, again, the stateofus.org, you can connect with us there. And, Lance, we've challenged people to tune in, right? That's uh, correct. To, to bring more listeners into, into the State of Us family. So if somebody wants to tell others how to listen, what are the ways they could share? Well, you've got uh, Stitcher, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else fine podcasts are found. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.